Jude Nixon. I'm Jude Nixon, president of the William Morris Society of the US. I wanna thank Monica for organizing these amazing um, programs for us and taking the lead on, on so many of them. And I want to welcome you. I'm, I'm actually in Boston, so you, you're hearing me from Boston, which is a crazy place tonight given the basketball finals. Um, William Tyre is has served as executive director and curator of the Glesner House of Chicago since October 2007. Bill holds a master's degree in historic preservation from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. In 2008, he published Chicago Historic uh, Prairie Avenue, part of the Images of America series published by Arcadia. In his role as director of the Glesner House, he oversees the daily operations of the museum, including collecting, collections management, programming, tours, interpretation, and restoration projects. He has developed and presented numerous talks in a wide variety of topics relating to the Glesner House. These have included lectures on craftswoman Frances Glesner, designer Isaac Scott, the early history of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, William Morris and the English Arts and Craft Movement, and several or various topics related to Prairie Avenue. In October 2017, he presented on the life and career of the Glesner's daughter, Frances Glesner Lee, during the opening weekend of Murder is Her Hobby, Francis Glesner Lee and the Nutshell Studies of Unexplained Deaths at the Ren Renwick Gallery of the Smithsonian American Art Museum in Washington, DC. Bill has been an active board member of Friends of the Historic Second Church since 2007. He's primarily responsible for the interpretation of Second Presbyterian Church and National Historic Landmark designated churches featuring a fully intact arts and crafts interior by Howard Van Doren Shaw, pre-Raphaelite murals by Frederick Clay Bartlett and a collection of stained glass windows, including nine by Lewis Comfort, Comfort Tiffany. He resides in a restored manager's house in Pullman, designated a national monument by President Barack, Barack Obama in 2015. So welcome, Bill. We look forward to your Glesner presentation. Well, thank you for that wonderful introduction. I'm going to go ahead and pull up my talk here. Hopefully everybody can see that now. So um, for those of you who have not been to Glessner House, uh, there's kind of a multi-layered story. We're obviously going to focus on the arts and crafts, but um, I've kind of broken it down into components. So we'll talk a little bit about the family, uh, the architecture, and then spend quite a bit of time, of course, uh, discussing the interior. Um, how it was furnished. So we're going to start out with the family. And I'll just mention this is the only picture we have of the four family members together. And this is actually at their summer estate, which was located in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. Our story begins with John and Francis Glessner, uh, shown here uh, shortly after their marriage in 1870. Uh, they were born and raised in central Ohio and immediately after their marriage came to Chicago where he operated the sales office for his firm, uh, which manufactured uh, farm machinery. Uh, the company was known as Warder, Bushnell and Glessner. He was the junior partner working his way up through the ranks. Um, and in time it became one of the larger um, farm machinery manufacturers in the country. In 1902, his firm and four others merged to form International Harvester, uh, which was the fourth largest corporation in the world at the time. And he was appointed vice president. And uh, so this is what gave him the means to construct the beautiful home we will be looking at this evening. Equally important to our story is his wife, Frances. Uh, her maiden name was Macbeth. And uh, one of the things I always say is very interesting about her is that not only did she embrace the arts and crafts in terms of furnishing her house, but she was also a very talented craftswoman herself. Um, here we see her at her workbench uh, where she is making silver. She started doing this about 1904 and uh, made hundreds of pieces, uh, very simple lines, the hammer mark part of the finish kind of representing the truth of how it was made. And you see her silver mark at upper right, which is the letter G, of course, for Glessner, 
uh, surrounding a honeybee, which represents one of her other hobbies, which was beekeeping. Uh, she was also known to make huge amounts of jewelry through the years. Uh, she would acquire semi-precious stones, uh, such as the black opals that you see at far left, um, and then set these into chains and brooches and bracelets and rings and things. Uh, really quite spectacular, um, her, her skill and her finished product. She was also a highly accomplished needleworker, and we have dozens and dozens of her original pieces here in the house. Um, on the left, we see the bed covering for her bed, uh, very much in the style of Charles Rennie Mackintosh, um, and then other pieces here on the right. And what's interesting is that uh, she did the needlework, but many of the designs were created specifically for her by friends who were craftsmen. So they truly are one of a kind pieces. Uh, together, the Glessners um, supported most actively in Chicago, the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. Uh, they were amongst the founders in the early 1890s and uh, faithfully supported it for the remaining, remaining years of their life. Um, the cards that you see at the right, um, Mrs. Glessner not only attended um, all of the performances, she also attended all of the rehearsals. And so these were passes to allow her to attend all of those rehearsals. The first one for uh, the 1890s, and then the second one written out that was good for the entire 20th century. Uh, we are very fortunate to have wonderful documentation about the house, which has allowed us to interpret and tell its rich stories very accurately. Um, on one level, we have extraordinary photo documentation, and this is largely to due to the Glessner's son, George, who was a very talented amateur photographer. You'll see his name and that designation at the bottom of the photo on the left. And so he took many, many photographs of the house over the years, uh, helping us to understand exactly how it was furnished and how all of the pieces were placed. Uh, Frances Glessner herself was a uh, journalist uh, would write out journal entries every Sunday. She did this for about 40 years. Uh, it starts before the house was even built and then ends about World War I. Uh, the transcribed copy, which um, we use, it's, it's searchable, is 5,200 pages long. So it tells you a bit about how much information is there to, uh, to learn about them and their home. John Glessner was a very talented writer and uh, frequently returned to the topic of the house and interacting with the architect, Henry Hobson Richardson. In 1923, he published, privately published, a book called The Story of a House, which was uh, really a very personal history of 1800 South Prairie Avenue. And he hired a professional photographer to take an additional 60 photos of both the interior and the exterior. Three copies were produced, one for himself and one for each of his children. And in recent years, we have reacquired one of the originals and have it available as a reprint. So let's talk a little bit about the house itself being built. In the spring of 1885, uh, the Glessners purchased a large lot at the southwest corner of Prairie Avenue and 18th Street. Uh, that lot would be visible in the right half of this photo. You can see there was an 1850s house standing there, which they fully intended to demolish and replace with a new house. Now, purchasing on Prairie Avenue was a sign of both business and social success. Um, this print uh, predates their purchase by a few years but it gives a sense of the types of houses that were standing on Prairie Avenue at the time. It really became the most exclusive residential street in the city of Chicago. And by the time the Glessners built here was lined with about 90 mansions within six blocks. Um, the neighborhood is located about two miles south of the heart of downtown Chicago. Among their most prominent neighbors would have been Marshall Field who engaged Richard Morris Hunt to design his second empire style house completed in the mid 1870s, uh, seen here. And then Caddy Corner to the Glessner House was the home of um, George Pullman, the railroad car manufacturer, also in the second empire style. 
um, and the drawing room, which you see from that house on the right side. Uh, to give you a sense of the scale of some of these houses, a portion, not the entire, but a portion of the third floor of this house behind that mansard roof um, was the location of a 200 seat theater that the Pullmans frequently used for um, entertainments to support their various charities. So uh, shortly after acquiring the lot, uh, the Glessners started interviewing potential architects. Uh, they went to New York, uh, met with several, including Stanford White and, and Bruce Price and others, um, and then eventually had the opportunity to meet with Henry Hobson Richardson, who of course had achieved national recognition in the 1870s for his iconic design of Trinity Church on Copley Square in Boston, which is the building you see on the right. And in fact, just at the time that they are meeting with Richardson, um, there was a contest sponsored by the American Institute of Architects uh, to name the 10 most important buildings in the country. Five of the 10 were designed by Richardson, including Trinity Church, which was number one on the list. Uh, Richardson came to Chicago, met with the Glessners over dinner, and as the journal's notes, between dinner and dessert, asked for a piece of paper and a pencil, at which point he sketched out the simple floor plan that you see here. What's really interesting about the floor plan is, although it was sketched within 24 hours of him seeing the lot, um, this is ultimately how the house was built. And it was quite innovative because we will see that uh, what he does is he actually faces many of the main rooms towards a private courtyard and not towards the street. Here we see an aerial shot of the house. Um, and although it's on a large corner lot, the long side, which is along the right side of the photo, faces north. And of course, he realized your sunlight comes from the south. So he pushed the house as close as he could to the north line um, to create this large uh, courtyard into which the rooms faced. Here we see a view of the courtyard from inside. You can see all of the large windows facing this direction. Um, this was important not only for light, but for comfort because this was the Glessner's winter home. They did not live here during the summer months. So having both the light and the warmth of the sun coming into your main rooms was an important consideration. Now, when Richardson met with the Glessner's, he saw this photo in their library and asked them if they liked the building. They said very much. And he said, I'm gonna make this the keystone of the design of your house. Well, what's interesting is this is a very humble structure. It's actually a building located in Abingdon Abbey in Oxfordshire, England. And it consists of the entrance to a stable yard on the right and a gardener's cottage on the left. One of the great mysteries is why the Glessners had the photo. They never went to England and this building was really not known at all outside of Abingdon Abbey. But Richardson followed through. We can see here the side of the Glessner house and you can see how the stable yard entrance is mimicked with the entrance to the coach house and then the strong horizontal lines picking up off of the gardener's cottage, the recessed entrance with the porch above. A lot of details really carried over very specifically. Um, also, the, this is really a good view of the north side of the house. And you will notice here how there's really minimal window openings on the north side. Um, Richardson actually ran a long servant's hallway along the north edge of the house. So these little windows just illuminate the hallway. And this was another way to keep it comfortable in the winter because it really blocked the impact of the north winds from, um, from the family rooms facing south. Uh, the Glessners soon after met with Richardson at his home in Brookline, just outside of Boston, and they were taken by his wonderful office library, which is shown here. Uh, they really loved the room. Mr. Glessner wrote quite a bit about it. And the Glessners asked that uh, Richardson actually use elements of this room in the design of the library for their Prairie Avenue home, which he did. And you will see everything from the beam ceiling to the large partner's desk in the middle of the room, uh, the Davenport sofa facing the fireplace and the mid-rise bookcases all carry over into the Glessner's home. Now, Francis Glessner started to learn about William Morris in 1883. 
he attended a lecture at what is known as the Fortnightly. It was a women's uh, women's organization um, where they would go to hear scholarly topics, author talks, that sort of thing. And there was a discussion about this book, which had just come out, Hopes and Fears for Art, a collection of several lectures that Morris had delivered. And um, <clears throat> I love this, this book review uh, because you think about the Glessners, of course, being upper class, and the review specifically talks about um, the wealthy and what they may have thought about uh, what Morris had to say of their uh, questionable taste. Um, how will the upper classes accept the principle that luxury is the deadly enemy of art, that the greater part of their artistic surroundings might well make a bonfire? Well, there you go. But Frances Glessner read the book cover to cover. She purchased it right after the lecture and uh, very soon is going on and um, uh, looking for Morris products to buy for her house. Um, now, Richardson was also a, um, a big fan of Morris and some Morris products were visible in that library space that I showed you a moment ago, including the portiers here, which are the peacock and dragon design and the Glessners specifically noted these. And as they planned for their own home, selected exactly the same pattern uh, for the main hall, uh, seen here in the historic photo on the left and the current reproduction um, portiers here on the right. There were other elements of Richardson's library office that carried forward into the Glessners' home. Uh, here we get another view of the fireplace and if we look at these detail shots, you can see that there was a series of uh, William de Morgan designed tiles over the uh, fireplace. And you can see what they actually look like here on the left. And then there were also at least two de Morgan vases uh, sitting on the mantel um, of this shape. We can't quite tell if this is the design, but it's uh, clearly the shape that we can identify. Uh, Morris um, and Richardson had actually met in 1882, uh, Richardson went to Europe for a couple of months and was very interested in meeting Morris, uh, met him both at Kelmscott Manor and Merton Abbey, and uh, met to Morgan at the same time, and that's when a lot of these products were actually acquired. We also know that Richardson bought a copy of the same book, Hopes and Fears for Art, while he was visiting Morris, so he and Francis Glessner had read exactly the same book by Morris. Um, the Glessners were very taken with the De Morgan ceramics. And as we will see in a little bit, as we do the virtual tour through the house, they selected uh, two sets of De Morgan tiles for fireplaces, as well as a wonderful galleon triptych, uh, which you see here at uh, lower right. So ground was broken for the house in June of 1886. Richardson had died just a couple of months earlier, but he had finished the design of the house. And he said of all the houses he ever designed, this is the one he would have most wanted to live in himself because it really did represent his mature style. Uh, this kind of uh, what became known as Richardsonian Romanesque actually named in his honor. Uh, controversial amongst the neighbors, but quickly recognized for its significance among other architects and designers of the period. Uh, here we see that classic north facing wall. Um, you know, we have wonderful quotes preserved by Frances Glessner in her journal. Uh, she was quite amused when people did not understand the design of the house and what they said about it. Uh, George Pullman, who said, I don't know what I ever did in my life to deserve having to look at that every day when I go out my front door. To her good friend, Mrs. Keith who was a little more diplomatic saying she did, hadn't quite decided whether or not she liked the house, but she knew where to flee in case of war. So there we go. So let's get started with our tour, which obviously will start with the front door. So in addition to the influence of the Romanesque, which uh, Richardson had studied, not only in his 1882 trip, but also during the Civil War when he was studying at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts, but Richardson was also very influenced by the colonial revival. And so you'll see a number of those elements here in the house, starting right at the front with the uh, symmetrical facade, 
ground level entrance, and then detailing up above, including things like dental trim and egg and dart trim and that sort of thing. Um, one of my favorite details on the front facade is a pair of Ouroboros, which are located at either end of the window sill. And uh, the Ouroboros is an interesting mythological creature, a dragon or a snake eating its own tail, symbolic of infinity or the cycle of life. Uh, what's interesting is in a little bit, we will see the Ouroboros appear again inside on a very significant um, ceramic vase by William de Morgan. And here is that vase. So uh, de Morgan used the Ouroboros a number of times. His father was actually a, a very well-known and well-respected mathematician in England at the time. And for a period after his father died, um, William, in his father's memory, used the Ouroboros because his father had been trying to prove infinity mathematically. And so it's interesting, it had a very specific significance for de Morgan. We think it had some significance for the Glessner, uh, Glessners in that it did show up on the front facade of their house in addition to the base here. Uh, you will also notice the carved capitals of the engaged columns or piers between the windows. Of particular note is the one right in the middle directly above the front door, which contains the monogram of the architect um, HHR. And this was something that was added to a few of the buildings that were underway at the time that he died as a way to memorialize him. Stepping through the front door, you're immediately approaching the set of stairs that will take you up to the main hall. And we do see here a wonderful reproduction Morris carpet uh, known as tulip and lily or just simple, uh, simply lily. Um, we've been able to replicate the carpets and wallpapers and things, of course, because we have all of the historic photos. Um, and so as you come into the main hall, you start to really see the space revealed as a whole. And uh, the Glessners did a lot of entertaining, so they wanted this large entry space to be able to welcome their guests. And it really is a full expression of Morris, not only the carpet we just saw on the stairs, but I'll talk about the carpet you see in the foreground. And then of course, hanging on the windows and the doorways, that peacock and dragon uh, woolen fabric that we saw a little bit earlier. Uh, you'll also notice kind of an understated elegance throughout the house. And I point that out with the newel post and the balusters on the main staircase, uh, detail of what you see here on the right. Um, again, kind of a colonial influence. Uh, the Glessners had seen a similar detail in the Henry Wadsworth Longfellow House and asked Richardson to incorporate that detailing. Now, uh, the rug that was located on the floor in the main hall uh, was this spectacular hand knotted rug by William Morris. And uh, those of you who saw Melinda Watts' recent talk uh, will know that this piece is now actually in the collection of the Art Institute of Chicago and is currently on exhibit in their Morris and Company, the Business of Beauty exhibit, which unfortunately will close next Monday, um, June 13th. But the carpet itself is uh, a copy of the original, which was designed for Swan House in London, and would then, of course, been custom sized for the Glessner's main hall. Uh, they acquired the carpet through Marshall Field and Company, which, as you can see from this ad of the period, um, advertised that they were the exclusive um, retailer for Morris's Hammersmith rugs. And uh, they bought a number of their Morris products directly from Marshall Field. Um, here we have another view of the main hall, kind of looking back the other direction towards those stairs where you come up from the main door. Uh, but what I like to point here is as you come up those stairs, you're facing this wonderful curved wall uh, with curved paneling and windows and a door. And centering the door is this uh, spectacular leaded glass window. This is actually a copy of a window that the Glessners saw at Richardson's own home and um, asked that a copy of it be made. It is what is known as chipped glass. So it's thick pieces of glass, special tool is used to chip it away. And as you can see, when the light comes through, it hits all of those little facets 
and just sparkles. It's really quite spectacular. I've never been able to get a photograph that adequately captures the light coming through. You really have to stand there and see it yourself. The Glessners were very proud of the fact that the house was designed by Richardson. And so after he died, they asked his widow for a photographic copy of a portrait that had just been painted of him by uh, Hubert von Herkimer, uh, the German artist living in England. And they always had it framed and hanging here in the main hall. And it is still in its original spot today. No family portraits on the walls, just the portrait of their architect. Uh, the main hall is actually a two-story space. As you see here, this image is taken from the landing of the main stairs. So you can see the second floor hall that sits directly above the space that we have just looked at. Now, somewhat unusual is the fact that the Glessners requested that their main bedroom, uh, which they shared, uh, be placed on the first floor. So it's actually immediately to the left of the entrance when you first come into the house. Um, and all of the bedrooms are full Morris interiors. And I start with this one because this is the only one, this was a very early restoration project um, in the house. And unfortunately, they did not select the actual Morris paper and upholstery that was used in the room. We know what they are. Um, we will put them back at some point, uh, but you certainly get a sense of what the space would have looked like at the time. Uh, perhaps the most striking element of this room is the fireplace. And here we can see those spectacular blue uh, William de Morgan tiles um, in place. And we're very excited about this because uh, those tiles were actually missing for many, many years. Uh, when the Glessners died in the 1930s, uh, the daughter removed the three sets of tiles from the house, reused them on fireplaces in her own home, and it was only five years ago, after an absence here of almost 80 years, uh, that we were able to reacquire the tiles and reinstall them in their original location. Uh, they were still numbered on the back as to what their location was. Um, so we were actually able to put the tiles back, each one exactly where it had started. Um, we also have some spectacular ceramics on the mantelpiece here. Um, Isaac Scott, who's a very important part of the story here, a very talented craftsman, uh, wood carver, a uh, longtime friend of the Glessners, uh, created a series of four what he called pilgrim vases during a period of time when he worked at the uh, Chelsea Ceramic Artworks. And this is one of the four. This is the largest with this very spirited design that you see on the left of this bird uh, standing on a branch and a lizard kind of approaching from the side. And even the beautifully detailed backside of the pilgrim vase, which nobody ever saw because these were always on a mantel shelf um, where there was no way to see the backside. Um, so uh, as noted, the bedroom was to the left when you first come into the house. The library is to the right when you enter. And so this is a view from the main hall looking into the library. We saw this image before. I talked about the similarity between their room and uh, Richardson's own library office, uh, but also of interest are the walls, which appear to simply be painted green, uh, much more um, complicated than that. Um, the walls were actually painted kind of a golden yellow, and then a translucent blue glaze was stippled on top of that, the combination of the blue and the yellow giving a very rich, deep green color. Uh, that we replicated during the restoration. Um, amongst the most interesting pieces in the room is the life mask and hands of Abraham Lincoln, um, an exact copy of the plaster casting that was done in 1860 when he was nominated for president. In the 1880s, John Glessner was um, one of the men who provided the funds to purchase the original plaster copy and give it to the Smithsonian, which is where it can be seen today. He was given the copy in bronze, which was supervised by Augustus St. Gaudens. A few other views of the library. Uh, you can see the partner's desk that they shared here. Quite unusual in the sense that uh, Mrs. Glessner, who would have sat in the chair that you see here with the blue seat, um, had a presence in the library. 
Of course, at the time, it was much more common than in these large houses. The library was very much the man's domain, uh, but this room was always designed to be used equally by both of them, and hence the design of the partner's desk. Um, in the distance beyond the chair, you can see a small cork alcove. Uh, this was an area where the Glessners could pin up their um, engravings that they were thinking of purchasing, live with them. Uh, so the walls are all lined with cork. It's like a big bulletin board. On the right, a uh, reduced size version of the William Shakespeare statue that is located in Central Park. That was designed by Francis Glessner's cousin, John Quincy Adams Ward. She liked it very much and asked him to make the small version that is in the library to this day. So uh, let's focus on that cork alcove for just a moment. Uh, here we see a close up of the shot we just uh, looked at. And then another view of the cork alcove. You can see it actually sits directly over the front door um, in a rather visible spot. Um, after they stopped collecting engravings, you can see they filled it with framed um, photographs of well known friends, everybody from Richardson and Augusta St. Gaudens to Frederick Law Olmsted, and they even had a portrait up there of William Morris. So we'll move into what would have been their primary entertaining space. Uh, they referred to it as their parlor, but it certainly functioned just as much as a music room. Uh, now we're really seeing the advantage of these rooms that are facing directly into the courtyard to capture all of that light coming from the south. It's a beautiful, bright room. Uh, the most elaborately decorated room in the house. And one of its real special features is the wall covering of which you see a detail here. They hired an English decorator by the name of William Prettyman uh, to design the wall covering one summer while they were away um, in New Hampshire. And seeing all of the William Morris uh, products being used in the house, uh, Prettyman took that as a cue to uh, design this. Um, we just see one pair of birds here, but as Morris often did with Strawberry Thief and other designs, uh, you know, one pair of birds faces each other, the next pair of, of opposed to each other. And so we see that along with certainly um, inspiration in the foliage. The, um, the hand-painted wall covering of which we had it exactly reproduced about 10 years ago is painted on canvas and consists of multiple layers of metallic paints and glazes to achieve a very rich kind of luminescent finish. Uh, the centerpiece of the room is the Glessner's wonderful Steinway piano. They personally went to the Steinway factory in New York to select the works. And then uh, it was sent off to the A.H. Davenport Company in Boston for the custom design case uh, made by Francis Bacon. So you can see the inlaid mother of pearl, various woods and things um, over the keyboard. Um, so it is a one of a kind instrument. And we're fortunate we still keep it in good repair and can use it for small concerts and recitals, just as the Glessners would have done in their day. Uh, here, another view of the parlor looking towards the fireplace, which is done in a beautiful Italian Sienna marble. Uh, but you'll see, for example, uh, Morris uh, Kennett draperies on the windows at the far left and other, um, other details throughout the space. Here we have a historic view of the parlor looking basically uh, at the same, same direction. And what I like to point out here is you'll notice that there are portieres hanging to either side of the fireplace in these very deep doorways heading into the uh, main hall. Um, these portieres were extraordinary um, embroidered silk panels based on a design known as Lotus by May Morris. Francis Glessner purchased the four panels as kits, had them completed within the first year she was in the house. Uh, she was a member of what was known as the Society of Decorative Art, which uh, had as its aim to train women who needed to find means of self-support. And of course, handicraft was considered a very appropriate way to do that. So Francis Glessner would bring in projects such as these portiers and hire the women of the society to execute them for her. Um, in 1918,
Francis Glessner donated the four panels to the Art Institute. It was the first time that anything from Morris and company had been donated to the Art Institute. Here we see a couple of detail shots uh, showing the wonderful um, needlework that was done by the Society ladies. Um, and what's interesting is, although they were donated to the Art Institute in 1918, uh, they were never put on public exhibition. Um, eventually, three of the four panels were discarded, were said to be in poor condition, and only one was kept in the collection. And, um, oops. and that is now part of the William Morris exhibit that is currently on display. So we had to wait 103 years after Francis Glessner's donation before it was beautifully conserved and put on um, display. And again, this is one of those things you really have to stand in front of it to appreciate its beauty. Yeah, and you can see kind of the overall design there. So we move into the dining room next. This is the largest room in the house. Uh, you can see, as we've seen in the main hall in the library, uh, the beam ceiling um, and we know that the Glessner's table opened to accommodate 18, um, hence the extension of the room at the end with the bay uh, so that the table would comfortably fit when it was fully extended. Above the oak paneling is uh, Japanese leather, which is of course a heavy embossed paper that is then gilt and painted to look like tooled leather. Uh, looking the other direction in the dining room, we're looking towards this wonderful fireplace wall. And uh, the Glessners were very proud of these tiles. They were able to acquire this set of tiles from Lockwood to Forest, a one-time collaborator with Tiffany. Uh, but the Forest would go to the Middle East, to East India and other places to bring back um, exotic products, which he would then sell to his American clientele. Uh, these tiles are Iznik tiles, of course, Iznik being a region of Turkey, known for its tile and ceramics, and uh, DeForest specifically acquired them in uh, Damascus. He had just enough tiles for the Glessner's fireplace. They were about 350 years old when the Glessner's acquired them, so they are now approaching almost 500 years old. Because of their significance, uh, the Glessner's had no mantle shelf, nothing hanging over the mantle or the fireplace, the focus was really on these tiles. And it's interesting because Isnik tiles greatly influenced uh, the ceramics of William de Morgan. So it's kind of fun that we have both the inspirational Isnik tiles in one room and de Morgan's actual tiles in another. I noted earlier that there's these long servants passages that run along the north side of the house. Uh, so here we see that passage looking um, in the left towards the kitchen wing and in the other photo looking towards the main uh, family part of the house. As we move into the kitchen wing, it's uh, divided up into five spaces. This is the butler's pantry uh, where of course dishes and crystal would be stored and washed in the copper sinks. The working part of the kitchen, it was a very modern hygienic space for the time with encaustic tile on the floor, actually made in Ohio. The walls are not tile, it's a glazed brick. It's the actual structure of the wall, which you can see if you look over the door and window. And in the space was the servant's call box or enunciator. Buttons in each of the main rooms of the house allowed family and guests to call for staff whenever they were needed. The box would ring, the little arrow would move to indicate where the call could come from so that someone could be dispatched as quickly as possible. Uh, moving into the ancillary spaces of the kitchen, we have the dry pantry. The Glessner summer estate was an active working farm. Uh, they would bring back huge amounts of food, uh, canned and preserved. As noted before, Frances Glessner was a beekeeper. We know some years she brought back an excess of a thousand pounds of honey with her, so it was no small operation. Uh, this is how the female servants would have entered the house. This is on the 18th or north side of the house. Uh, this beautiful arch with um, the huge segments. And uh, it's a wonderful photo that the Glessner's son took, a uh, very carefully posed so that we see the silhouette of the cook behind the window shade in the kitchen. 
and it clearly is a posed photo we tried to recreate this a few years ago and uh, the cook would have almost had to have been on her knees uh, for her head to be in the right position. Um, the servant's entrance had its own address. So if the uh, staff were to receive mail um, or perhaps a guest, they would come to 35 18th Street, never to 1800 South Prairie Avenue, which was the Glessner's uh, main address. And here we have a restored servant's bedroom. We can see how they uh, lived. Frances Glessner was very specific about the servant's quarters. Her requirements were that they each have a private room, that they have a window facing the courtyard for light and fresh air, that um, the same wood is used. So you can see this beautiful quarter sawn oak, just like we see in the family part of the house. And then at far left, the uh, closet. She was a big advocate of closets a relatively new concept in the 1880s. Uh, the male servants had their own entrance, um, which contained this wonderful, what Richardson referred to as bullseye glass. Um, he used it in a number of his buildings, but he loved the effect that, that uh, the center pontal gave and then how it kind of distorted the view out of the glass. Um, at the very back of the house, we have the coach house which originally was divided into two spaces. The foreground would have been for carriages, the far area for the uh, six stalls for the Glessner's horses. In uh, 1906, the Glessner's acquired their first automobile, removed the stalls and the dividing wall and opened it into a large uh, garage. And this continues to be used today as our primary programming and rental event space. Now, moving up to the second floor, of course, we have a series of bedrooms at this level. You can see a large second floor hall space, which kind of functioned as a, a sitting room. There would have been additional chairs and things here for people to sit and read and have small conversations. Um, Isaac Scott figures very largely in this part of the house. I discussed him earlier because of his uh, picture frames. Um, he referred to himself as a medievalist. Uh, but a wood and metal worker and really quite exceptional. Um, the Glessners first met Scott in 1875 at what was known as the Interstate Industrial Exposition here in Chicago. And he was exhibiting several pieces of what he referred to as art furniture, including this wonderful bookcase you see on the left. The Glessners ordered a copy of that with just a few modifications, which was delivered to them a few months later and it started this collaboration that lasted for more than four decades. Um, the second floor contains bedrooms for both the both of the Glessner's children. This is the son's bedroom. Uh, he was 16 when they moved into the house. He was allowed to select the decoration of his room. So you can see, although it is all William Morris, um, it's in more of a masculine uh, color palette. Uh, the monochromatic uh, poppy wallpaper, and then the sage green um, tulip draperies. We do not have the furnishings for this room, so we have used it to exhibit yet a few additional pieces made by Isaac Scott actually for the Glessner's previous home um, before they moved to Prairie Avenue. You can see this mantle in its original setting and then on display now in George's bedroom. The other fireplace mantle, which came out of their uh, principal bedroom, um, also now on display in George's room. Perhaps our most intact and, and full, fullest expression of William Morris is the daughter's bedroom, which has no less than five uh, different Morris patterns going on simultaneously. Um, the blossom wallpaper is actually a modern digital reproduction of the Morris original but you also see another Morris pattern on the, um, the window draperies and a Morris carpet in the foreground. The upholstered pieces, both the side chairs and the daybed are African marigold, apparently a favorite of Francis Glessner's because we know it shows up in at least one other room as well on pieces of furniture. And then this wonderful embroidered center panel um, one of several by Morris called Artichoke. This was originally designed as a cushion cover or a large pillow cover. Uh, there's some 
thought about the actual designer or executor of the border around that, um, whether that was Morris or Royal School of Needlework or something done here locally in Chicago, we're not certain. This room also has a couple of spectacular Isaac Scott frames. Uh, this wonderful uh, example here uh, with the prints of the blue grotto of Capri. And then a really wonderful uh, Gothic revival frame containing three of the Glessner's oldest and most important engravings. Uh, they were very interested in the history of engravings and tried to acquire a few of the very earliest examples that were known. This is um, the guestrum, the female guestrum, and the wallpaper in here is Arcadia, which was a design of May Morris. And uh, the furniture is actually about the only non-American furniture in the house. It's French. The Glessners made one trip to Europe in 1890, purchased this in France and sent it back for this room. Interestingly, in spite of their strong interest in the English arts and crafts in Morris, their one and only trip to Europe did not include a trip to England. Here we see a detail of that Arcadia paper. And what's interesting is not only is this a design of May Morris, who you see here on the right, but May Morris was actually a guest here in the Glessner house uh, when she came to the US in 1909 for her lecture tour. Frances Glessner arranged for May to come and speak to what was known as her Monday morning reading class. And so May came and gave a talk on design in costume. And this is the fireplace in that guest room. This is our other set of uh, William de Morgan tiles. In two designs, you can see every other tile has the flower. And those that are floral um, are actually uh, feature his luster finish. Um, as many of you probably know, these iridescent or luster finishes had been done for hundreds of years. And then kind of the process was forgotten and De Morgan is really credited with the rediscovery of how to do those. So um, when you catch these tiles in the right light, that, that luster finish is just spectacular. And here we see the bed covering in that room. Uh, another piece executed by the Society of Decorative Art in Chicago from a kit that came from the Royal School of Art Needlework in London. Uh, the particular design is known as Image Tulip because the uh, design was created by a man named Selwyn Image, uh, but really wonderful um, needlework with this gold thread and uh, wonderful detailing. Here we see the other guest room on the second floor. Again, a full expression of Morris, uh, the double bow wallpaper, um, another Morris design for the draperies, <clears throat> excuse me, and then a modern carpet, but in the style of Morris, because we can see in the historic photos that there was a Morris carpet there. Uh, Morris's carpets are amongst the least documented of his production because he often designed carpets that were made by others. So we were unable to identify conclusively what pattern it was, other than we were certain it was Morris. Another view of the room. And when we had the double bow wallpaper reproduced, we were delighted to learn that the Morris archive still had all of the original hand carved fruitwood blocks for printing the paper. And so we had it printed in the traditional manner just as the Glessners would have had done in the early 1890s. Um, and then I also like to point out this, this just wonderful spirited carved design that you see here on the headboards. Um, another example of the work by A.H. Davenport that did so much of the furniture for the house. And then lastly, going to the lower level of the house, we have the school room. The children were educated by private tutor in this room, uh, received an excellent education. Um, and that was especially important for the daughter because of course, girls did not often go off to college at that time. She was quite brilliant and so took full advantage of the educational opportunities presented to her. Um, she, as mentioned briefly during my introduction, went on to really establish the field of legal medicine, what we would today call um, forensic science, and became very well known, created this whole series of miniature death scenes known as the Nutshell Studies of Unexplained Death, which were used as training tools for state police. They're actually still used as training tools to this day. 
And in recognition of her work in the 1940s, she was um, appointed the first female state police captain in the United States. Eventually, nine states and the city of Chicago all awarded her the status of captain. She was particularly um, impressed with the English system of um, homicide and death investigation, spent a lot of time at Scotland Yard, and of course, her interest in miniatures resulted in her going to see Queen Mary's dollhouse while she was in England on one of her trips. And she noted in a letter back to her son um, how impressive Queen Mary's dollhouse was, but then closed with, I think I could have done better. Um, one of her models actually made it over to London a few years ago for an exhibit called Forensics, which was held at the Welcome Collection. So I think she would have been very pleased to know that it actually made it all the way over there. So the later history of the house, the Glessners, of course, um, died in the 1930s. But uh, prior to that, in 1924, they had made arrangements to donate the house to the American Institute of Architects. They saw the neighborhood changing around them. They saw houses starting to come down. Um, they realized that they were soon to be the only surviving work by Richardson in Chicago. And so this arrangement was made. However, by the time the Glessners died in the mid thirties, the country was in the midst of the Great Depression. And so the AIA refused the gift. Eventually the daughter donated it to the Armour Institute. Um, which is now known as the Illinois Institute of Technology. They used it to host their human engineering laboratory. But it was also at exactly the time of the donation that Mies van der Rohe was coming to the um, Armour Institute to head up the Department of Architecture. He was deeply interested in Glessner House, referring to it as a wonderful architectural document. And he actually had a lot to say when the house was threatened with demolition 30 years later. Eventually, the Lithographic Technical Foundation moved into the building, setting it up as a research foundation uh, to study inks and printing methods. And so you can see the once beautiful dining room now converted to a laboratory. Uh, the foundation moved out in 1965. They put the house up for sale. Their initial plan was simply to demolish the building and sell the vacant land, which was typically what was done on Prairie Avenue. However, a group of architects really came together who understood the significance of the building and did not want to see it lost. And so in 1966, what was known as the Chicago School of Architecture Foundation was formed to purchase the building. And one of the chief advocates for the project was the modernist architect, Philip Johnson, seen here on the right, uh, who in a newspaper article said, Glessner House is the most important house in the country to me. Eventually the house was designated both a Chicago landmark. It was one of the first two buildings in the city to be so designated. And by 1976 was made a national historic landmark as well. So that uh, brings to an end, a look at the Glessner house. Uh, we like to think of the house as, as really being a timepiece in the sense that when you come for a visit, it really appears as though the Glessners have just stepped out for a moment. It feels very natural cozy and inviting just as they wanted it to be. So we do hope you've enjoyed tonight's tour and that if you have not visited or even if you have, that you will come and see us in person sometime soon. Thank you very much. Bill, thank you so much. That was so wonderful. Um, I'm going to change here so we can see each other and i've had you on a pin so let me remove that and get the right view here great um that was so wonderful i just feel like i was transported to chicago and traveled through time i wanted to ask a question about um and for those who have questions please include them in the chat thread and i will i will share them um my name is Monica Bowen. I, I help chair the programs committee for the William Morris Society. And for those of you who um, don't know, Jude mentioned me at the beginning. Um, and I wanted to ask one question about 
uh, how the Glessners were using this as a winter home. I was just thinking about how beautiful that space is and filled with, it just seems like it's full of springtime and summertime with all of the flowers and leaves and plants. And um, I wondered if, if we know what the Glessners used for their interior decoration of their summer estate that you were mentioning, do they, do they have a similar aesthetic or is, do you feel like this winter home was really trying to revive spring and summer for them uh, with their choices? Um, that's a very good question. We don't have nearly as many photos of the interior of their summer home, but the pictures we have showed that it was actually quite simple. Uh, there was not a lot of pattern on the walls and that sort of thing. It was much simpler, but what it did have was a number of very, very large uh, picture windows so that you had these beautiful vistas looking at the presidential range and the White Mountains and across the, the terrace gardens that had been laid out by Frederick Law Olmsted. So in that sense, for the summer home, it was really all about trying to bring in what was around you outside as much as possible into the house. But as you say here in Chicago, of course, during the winter months, they had to literally find a way to bring it inside. And, and you do see so much of that with, with the wallpapers and the fabrics and things. That's fascinating. So it really, they have the same aesthetic both times. It's only having actual nature as opposed to um, bringing nature into their winter home. I love that. Thanks. Um, I'm seeing several questions coming in. I know I saw one from Florence. Let me go up there. Um, Florence was asking um, about Glesser's relationship to the International Harvester um, and particularly asking if he was present at the time of the Haymarket events of the 1880s. Yes, so that's very interesting. So when the Haymarket riot happened um, in May of 1886, the Glessners were living at that time just a few blocks away. Uh, Mrs. Glessner actually records they were sitting together in their library and they heard the explosion when the bomb went off. And Mr. Glessner was uh, president of what was known as the Citizens Association, which played a big role in kind of, kind of getting the city back under control after that. But I think what's most interesting about Haymarket is that happened exactly one month before the Glessners broke ground for their Prairie Avenue home. And as I noted, people referred to it as the fortress and that sort of thing. And newspaper articles, not understanding Richardson's design aesthetic, um, described this fortress-like exterior as the Glessners being afraid of labor unrest. And that's why they were building this fortress to protect themselves. Uh, one newspaper went so far as to say, admittance would only be allowed when the drawbridge was lowered over the moat. Well, I've never seen any evidence that the moat was actually built, but um, but you actually still read that to this day that they were so afraid of labor unrest that that's why they built the house. And one of the big things to kind of counter that is, as you notice during the tour, their principal bedroom is on the first floor and it has two very large windows facing directly onto Prairie Avenue. So in this house, their bedroom is actually much more accessible to the street than in a typical house. So that kind of tends to undo the fact that they were scared of intruders or unrest. That's fascinating. Um, so trying to interpret that Richardsonian Romanesque in a very different way, connecting it to what was going on. Um, thank you. Um, Pat also is asking a question uh, as to whether you're able to acquire objects original to the house still. Um, and I, that kind of was my own question too. I was wondering about restoration efforts. Um, you mentioned several in the presentation and I wondered you know, what the current status was for that too. Yeah, so we are very fortunate. We have a wonderful relationship with a lot of the descendants. There are over a hundred living descendants um, and I stay in touch with many of them. And just a few weeks ago, when I took a group from Glessner House to Baltimore for a week for a study tour, we actually stopped at the farm of one of the descendants and picked up an original piece of Isaac Scott furniture, a chest of drawers that uh, was from Francis Glessner's dressing room. And so we brought that back set it back in place. It needs a fair amount of restoration in the kind of 1960s anti-Victorian period. Uh, some descendant kind of chopped off the carved top of the chest, but we have his original design drawing, so we will have that remade. Um, and then in August, I'm actually going up to the Rocks, the summer estate, to visit that descendant, and I'm actually driving back a truck with several more pieces of furniture. So things still do continue to come back to us today. That's wonderful. So this um, 
mention of the descendants actually is interesting and I think it ties into what Jan is saying um, or Jan I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing that in the thread saying how is the house utilized and shared today um, do, are the ascent descendants involved in that or is it because um, I know you also mentioned that Society of Architects too right so the um the family is involved i mean they're their supporters they're members that sort of thing but they're not actively involved in the organization in the mid 1990s we were spun off as a separate 501c3 nonprofit known as glessner house museum so we are our own entity um and so that's part of what i do every year is help to raise the funds to keep this place going both operating and for special restoration projects and that sort of thing so um, you know, we use it for a variety of programs, um, you know, things like I talked about, you know, we do little concerts in, in the parlor, we utilize the dining room for, you know, food related events. We were all ready to start a wonderful series of lectures in the library, kind of in the style of Mrs. Glessner's Monday morning reading class um, that was due to start in March of 2020. Well, obviously that didn't happen, but we hope to get back to that. One of the things we really want to do is give people as many opportunities to experience the house as the Glessners actually used it, rather than just walking through on a tour, but actually being able to sit in the rooms and hear music or eat food or hear somebody talk and really get a sense of how those rooms were intended to be used. That's lovely. That's wonderful. Um, thank you. I'm seeing a few more questions coming in that relate to architects. So um, David saying, I wonder if we know if Richardson may have known the Glessners or shown the Glessners the interior of Robert Treat Payne House Stonehurst, which Richardson completed much earlier, um, noting there are many striking similarities. I don't know if uh, we know of any connection that way. Um, yes, that's a very good question. We know that the Glessners did visit several of Richardson's other buildings. Um, they saw a couple of his libraries. They did see a couple of his houses in Washington, D.C. We don't have a record that they specifically saw the Robert Treat Payne house, uh, but I have been there and I will agree that there are definitely some similarities, which I think comes from the fact that it's obviously the same architect doing both. Um, but it's a very different expression. And what we actually like to say is we consider Glessner House to be Richardson's um, urban residential masterpiece. Mm -hmm. And the Robert Treat Payne House is really the masterpiece of the country house because the settings are, of course, entirely different. Yeah, I like that parallel. That's a, that's a nice one. Um, in thinking about architects too, um, another question is coming in wondering how Frank Lloyd Wright's ideas factor into the aesthetics of the home. Um, I, I was wondering that I also was thinking of Lewis Sullivan too, just with Chicago and uh, wondered about your thoughts for those two architects. Yes, absolutely. We, um, we talked during our tours quite a bit about how Louis Sullivan was very much influenced by the work of Richardson. And um, in particular, the other building that Richardson was doing at the same time as Glessner House in Chicago was the Marshall Field Wholesale Store, which Richardson considered one of his most important buildings. And Sullivan was just starting his design for our auditorium building at that time, which looked very, very different in early design sketches. Sullivan sees the Marshall Field Wholesale Store dramatically revises his design for the auditorium and it ends up really being an homage to Richardson. Uh, what we like to say is because Richardson dies right at this point at the age of 47, mm -hmm. is Sullivan is really the one that picks up the ideas and carries it forward to the next level. So he continues to simplify things. He gets rid of the rusticated stone and starts working with the sm smooth wall surface and really working with the voids of the window openings and that sort of thing. So it's very important. And of course, this is at exactly the same time that Frank Lloyd Wright is working in the Adler and Sullivan office. And if you look at a few of the very early houses that Frank Lloyd Wright designed, uh, kind of known as his uh, bootleg houses, um, you can see some strong similarities in floor plans and some other details that one cannot help but think that Wright had to have known of Glessner House. It was very well published in the architectural journals, but the Glessners also noticed that architects were showing up at the door all the time asking to see the house. Frank Lloyd Wright, of course, would not have been a well-known name, so they often don't say who the person was, but we're sure that one of those architects was, was Frank Lloyd Wright. 
That makes a lot of sense. And that having Sullivan as a connection point too um, really makes sense going back to Richardson. Thank you. Um, I'm seeing um, one more question coming in. Um, has the Glessner House received loaned items or loaned out items to other house museums? I know you mentioned the Art Institute of Chicago in your presentation. Um, and any other loans? Um, yes, we actually have a long history of, of primarily things being loaned out from the collection. And uh, one of the programs we're going to be doing in October, uh, October is the 50th anniversary of the very important Princeton Arts and Crafts show, which really kind of put arts and crafts on the map. And um, several pieces from Glessner House were in that show. And in fact, you, you open the catalog and the very first piece in the catalog is that Isaac Scott bookcase that we saw earlier. Um, so we have been loaning pieces ever since. We're also very excited because we are kind of winding down uh, doing weddings um, as, as, as a way to support our operations. We're looking to go other directions. And one of the reasons we're doing that is because we would like to start being able to use that beautiful large coach house as an exhibition gallery to be able to bring ex exhibitions in, which we've never been able to do because of course all the rooms themselves are restored. So we're looking for some really exciting opportunities to really expand that that part of our operation. That sounds lovely and an additional reason to to continually visit the Glessner House. That's wonderful. Um, I'm seeing several other um, compliments uh, in the chat thread. Thanking you so much for this lecture. This has just been a delight um, to feel like I um, got to visit both England and Chicago in the same presentation. Um, and I'm seeing other heads nodding here too. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. And um, let's all go to Chicago the next time we can. <laughs> thank you so much, Bill. Okay. Thank you, my pleasure. Have a wonderful night, everyone.